we are very happy to have uh, our guest researcher here, uh, Aram Ferzan, in the evolution of Armenia's foreign policy. So we are really looking forward to your presentation here, Aram. Thank you. Uh, we will listen now to uh, Aram's presentation, and following that, it will be possible, of course, to give uh, comments and feedback to questions from uh, the audience here on uh, campus. Uh, but also, we will be following this uh, on live chat. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, given that we have interdisciplinary audience, uh, and there might be terms you are not necessarily familiar with, Please uh, feel free to interrupt me any moment and ask questions if you need some. So today's uh, presentation is uh, part of my broader research on Armenia's and Georgia's uh, uh, foreign policies. Uh, and today I specifically uh, focus on Armenia country, which is uh, often known uh, because of the Armenian genocide, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, as well as uh, Armenian diaspora. Uh, sometimes it's uh, even labeled as Russia's representative in the South Caucasus region. Uh, so within this research, I will try to explain how and why this uh, stigma was attached to Armenia. And uh, actually, uh, since the independence, uh, Armenia's foreign policy has basically revolved around uh, core following issues such as Nagorno-Karabakh conflict resolution in the form of its recognition, Armenian genocide recognition and Armenian-Turkish relations rapprochement, as well as balanced uh, partnership with the uh, European Union uh, and Russia. Uh, actually, regarding uh, genocide, some studies contend that it would be a futile attempt to understand Armenian collective memory and identity without uh, placing genocide at its very center. It's become the prism uh, through which not only 20th century, but the entire uh, history uh, has been viewed in retrospect. And uh, the enemy image of Turkey has uh, further reinforced uh, due to its solidarity with Azerbaijan in Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And uh, overall, given uh, the structural constraints uh, facing Armenia, it's uh, volatile geopolitics of uh, bordering uh, sanctioned Iran, uh, double blockade imposed by Turkey and Azerbaijan, as well as uh, Russia's political and economic bullying. All this led uh, to content that there is lack of choice in constructi constructing its uh, political reality. Uh, meanwhile, uh, this study argues that in order to assess comprehensively the lack of choice, it's essential to shift the focus away from structural constraints to ideational and, ideational and intentional dimensions of Armenia's foreign policy. So regarding data, the study relies on observations from uh, foreign policy speeches, newspaper articles, official documents, and interviews which provide a body of discourse. Uh, the critical discourse analysis has been employed to assess how the Armenian policymakers use narratives to justify foreign policy decisions and legitimate uh, their power. So overall, my uh, broader research uh, draw, draws on constructivist uh, premises, uh, assuming that foreign policy behavior is uh, socially constructed, historically determined, and uh, culturally contingent. Within this uh, particular uh, uh, presentation, I've tried to apply uh, the framework of uh, a prominent Swedish scholar, Walter uh, Garstnais. Uh, as you can see, his uh, model outlines three main dimensions in foreign policy analysis. Uh, structural dimension, which entails uh, objective external uh, constraints, uh, organi organizational setting, dispositional dimension, related to perceptions, values, as well as uh, intentional dimension, including choice, motivation, and he scrutinizes the inter interaction of these dimensions and their impact on foreign policy action. According to this model, uh, structural dimension has uh, 
casual effect on dispositional one and this, uh, the latter has casual effect on intentional dimension. However, I specifically focus on individual level uh, factors in explaining Armenian foreign policy without giving uh, casual weight to structural constraints. And uh, a question may arise of uh, why I deem uh, individual level factors essential in explaining Armenian foreign policy. Uh, the primary reason is a strong, I would say, hyper-presidential <coughs> power in Armenia. Actually, uh, post-Soviet transition has led to the accumulation of uh, strong presidential power at the expense of uh, two other branches of the government. Uh, none of them actually uh, has any power uh, to limit the president's power. And, uh, Especially in early 2000s, Armenia shifted to hyper-presidential system. And the second reason that uh, also uh, prioritize individual level factors are uh, structural and strategic uncertainty in the post-Soviet South Caucasus region characterized by non-routine, complex uh, situations and fluctuations, which uh, evidently magnified the importance of an individual with uh, his or her uh, distinctive perceptions and beliefs. So, uh, uh, within this study, uh, this study centers on uh, basically uh, foreign policy behaviors of three Armenian presidents. And naturally, the first part focuses on first president's foreign policy behavior, uh, who was uh, arguably the most pragmatic Armenian president with a uh, resolve to uh, heal frictions with neighboring Azerbaijan and Turkey and uh, put Armenia on a sustainable path. The analysis of his uh, uh, speeches, overall his discourse, uh, suggests that he saw the Armenian identity and collective memory as detrimental to country's development and embarked on constructing new uh, civic and neutral identity. He consistently uh, strived to break down the enemy image of Azerbaijan and Turkey, and even contrary to received wisdom, regarded them as Armenia's most natural allies, meanwhile simultaneously resorted to uh, offering of Russia. And uh, even uh, under sheer pressure, he didn't uh, put the issue, uh, raise the issue of Armenia's genocide recognition, given its repercussions for Armenian-Turkish relations. Moreover, he went uh, so far as to contend uh, that uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is Russian conspiracy against Armenia and Azerbaijan. And uh, the overall assumption actually was that self-destructive conflicts uh, with neighbors would smoothly uh, push Armenia into the Russian arms given that uh, small and fragile Armenia would be incapable of uh, catching up with uh, military buildup of oil-rich Azerbaijan. However, what is uh, also interesting that unlike his successors, as also I noted, he adopted a non-Russian uh, foreign policy agenda and once he even uh, employed the term ideological confrontation to describe uh, Armenian-Russian relations. Actually, in his discourse, there was a marked skepticism about uh, normal interstate Armenian-Russian relations and uh, fear that consistent with its uh, imperial nature, Russia would uh, seek to absorb Armenia politically, economically. And uh, also repeatedly stressed that as long as Russia was chiefly uh, preoccupied with uh, domestic issues, Armenia uh, would have a chance, opportunity to increase its maneuvering space, especially by uh, making the most of the regional cooperation and achieving a speedy conflict resolution. However, what is also important that in contrast uh, to his successors, he had relatively weak agency. In early 1990s, there was a so-called Yegrapa Union, of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, war veterans led by uh, Defense Minister Vazgen Saksan, who was arguably the most influential uh, political figure of that period. And he was significantly bound by this union, 
in fact, uh, his efforts at redefining the enemy images of Azerbaijan and Turkey didn't resonate with uh, nationalist hardliners, particularly this union, as well as considerable part of uh, post-war Armenian society. Uh, med media reports and uh, also some interviews with uh, politicians of that period suggest that uh, he was subjected to heavy criticism for his so-called pro-Turkish and pro-Azerbaijani stances. And eventually, under huge pressure, he resigned in 1998 and succeeded by one of the hardliners, uh, one of prominent leaders of uh, Karabakh IV and uh, its first president, the uh, disputed territory's first president, Robert Kocharyan. And it's, uh, evidently, there are essential differences between their foreign policy behaviors. Uh, first, firstly, regarding uh, their agencies in contrast to the Petrosan, who was bound by the Agrapa Union. Uh, the assassination of uh, Defense Minister, uh, minister Vazgen Saksan substantially increased his agency. In 1999, a group of gunmen broke into the Armenian parliament and assassinated uh, Prime Minister. At that, that period, uh, Vazgen Saksan was already Prime Minister and the Head of Parliament, as well as uh, other uh, prominent politicians. And uh, as I'll uh, indicate later, this uh, proved to have impacted Armenian foreign policy. And what's not worth it that uh, this actually horrendous crime has not been entirely uncovered so far. Uh, so this assassination of this leader and gradual uh, dissolution of the Agrapa Union substantially increased uh, Kocharyan's agency and he uh, turned into an indispensable actor. Secondly, uh, Kocharyan significantly hardened positions on Azerbaijan and Turkey. He raised the issue of genocide recognition as well as securitized Nagorno-Karabakh conflict by asserting that there could be no concession <coughs> regarding its status. Evidently, he was trying to appease uh, the uh, voters that were actually dissatisfied with the Petrosan's planned position and uh, st uh, stances on sensitive issues. However, uh, what's actually a bit puzzling is that initially he adopted European foreign policy agenda by stating that the uh, European path would provide best uh, chance at Armenia's development and uh, placed emphasis on rapprochement with the European Union and NATO. However, uh, shortly he shifted to a strategic alliance with Russia. And the biggest puzzle perhaps involves explaining why this happened and what resulted in this particular foreign policy output. Uh, many, several studies have fallen prey to reductionism of uh, structural constraints contending that uh, Russia's renewed post-Soviet policy during Putin's presidency uh, influenced Armenia's foreign policy behavior. Meanwhile, my argument is that in that particular period of time, Russian grip on Armenia was not tight enough to influence its behavior. And in order to understand this, it's necessary to specifically focus on individual level factors. In contrast to neighboring Georgia, which was equally dependent on Russia, and equally vulnerable, Armenia ended up in uh, entirely plunging into the uh, orbit of the Russian influence. So, uh, regarding the core structural constraints under which uh, Kocharyan's foreign policy unfolded, uh, evidently, uh, from the very outset of his presidency, Russian President Putin adopted policy aimed at uh, regaining Russian control in so-called sphere of its privileged interest, sphere of its influence, as Russians tend to deem. And uh, Russian policy specifically focused on monopolization and takeover of strategic economic and energy assets in post-Soviet countries. Uh, as well as retaining and reinforcing its military influence in those countries. In effect, it was, uh, Russian policy was nothing beyond promotion of authoritarianism, 
a production of autocracies uh, with their goal uh, to their political and economic absorption. And uh, out of all post-Soviet countries, this policy produced exceptional outcomes in Armenia, where in early 2000s, uh, all uh, strategic economic and energy infrastructures, around 90% of uh, energy producing capacities, were taken over by Russian state-run companies. And also, tightening economic grip in, uh, gave Russia powerful political leverage to influence Armenia's foreign policy behavior. Shortly, Armenia became one of the founding members of Russia-led Collective Security Treaty Organization. And Armenia-Russian military cooperation significantly intensified in the fall of 2003, on the eve of the Rose Revolution in Georgia. Uh, Armenia and Russia signed a series of agreements that uh, uh, contributed to reinforcement of Russian military uh, presence in Armenia. And uh, as you can see, during Kocharan's presidency, uh, his presidency actually led to uh, steady militarization of Armenia. So, uh, to explain shift, uh, this shift, as uh, I indicated earlier, I uh, focus specifically not on, uh, on dispositional and intentional dimensions rather than on structural constraints. And the argument is that in uh, Armenian hyper-presidential system, Kocharan's actions were indispensable to foreign policy outputs. The assassination of above-mentioned uh, politicians turned him into core foreign policy maker. And as I also indicated, it significantly impacted Armenia's foreign policy. So it's not worth it that uh, his presidency led to downward democratic trends in Armenia. Ample evidence prompts uh, to regard uh, Kocharan as authoritarian leader, uh, with uh, actually penchant uh, for suppressing dissent and pluralism across the country until launched a massive crackdown on opposition, uh, media, and Armenia actually uh, plunged into authoritarianism during his presidency. And therefore, to explain Kocharan's foreign policy decisions, I draw on the assumptions of authoritarian learning, uh, authoritarian learning framework, which is uh, concerned with learning from both internal and external experience with a focus on adaptability, lesson drawing, and emulation. So uh, this framework analyzes uh, how decision makers, particularly those drawn to authoritarian governance, uh, formulate choice using uh, past reference points, how they learn from uh, other experiences and how those lessons uh, translate into substantive foreign policy or uh, into, uh, broadly speaking political decisions. And uh, here I distinguish two uh, core lessons learned by Kocharyan. The first lesson that Rose Revolution in Georgia and uh, uh, Orange Revolution in Ukraine gave him was that uh, in contrast to West-oriented democratizing countries, Russia supported uh, regimes in, uh, for example, in Belarus, Kazakhstan, were widely shielded from color revolutions. And uh, Arguably, it's no coincidence that Armenia signed a series of milit uh, military and political agreements with Russia on the eve of the uh, Georgian Rose Revolution, uh, out of fears of uh, spillover effects of that revolution also. In Armenia, meanwhile, Russia uh, significantly helped to militarize Armenia, build up security forces and create uh, pro-regime groups that later resulted in downward democratic trends. Clearly, European foreign policy path would uh, assume substantial democratic reforms. Meanwhile, uh, Kocharan's presidency and his policy was in entirely incompatible with democratic reforms and democratization. It, uh, it follows that Russia's pursuit of promoting authoritarianism significantly fit the Armenian president's personal ambitions and also influenced its behavior. The second lesson 
uh, learned from uh, his predecessor's experience is that the emphasis on rapprochement with Azerbaijan and Turkey would incite animosity in Armenia, would run into resistance. Meanwhile, uh, frequent appeals to the enemy images would help to actually distract attention from domestic malpractices and consolidate his power. Uh, he went uh, so far, Kocharyan went so far as to contend that uh, Armenians and Azerbaijanis are ethnically incompatible. Therefore, there could be no uh, peaceful coexistence between these uh, two countries. And uh, regarding intentional dimension also, securitization of Nagorno-Karabakh conflict may well explain the strategic choice of Russia, uh, widely framed as the pivotal actor in conflict resolution, and arguably by intensifying uh, military partnership with Russia, the Armenian president hoped that it would lead to Russian more benevolent position on uh, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Uh, besides, uh, given that he uh, gained public and political support due to his staunch op opposition to his uh, predecessor's foreign policy. Indeed, uh, he would avoid st uh, steps that could undermine his uh, reputation of a hardliner in Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. So overall, I assume uh, that the lessons Kocharan has learned from his predecessor's uh, decline, coupled with those uh, uh, from steady survival of Russian-supported regimes, have significantly influenced the choice of Russia and his policy, uh, toughening policy towards neighbors, Azerbaijan and Turkey. And uh, regarding his successor, Ser Sarkisan, who is uh, current president, uh, he can be viewed as somewhere in between, between two uh, previous presidents, both in terms of his foreign policy agenda and agency. <coughs> Actually, initially he came up with uh, ambitious foreign policy agenda aimed at uh, redefining relations with neighbors, Nagorno-Karabakh conflict resolution, uh, and also a profound advancement towards the European Union. However, uh, his, uh, over time his optimism uh, uh, significantly diminished, and uh, particularly in the, uh, the setback in normalizing Armenian-Turkish relations significantly diminished his optimism. When Armenia and Turkey signed protocols on the establishment of diplomatic relations, the breakthrough seemed to be a tense. Yet, the signed protocols have uh, remained on paper so far. And apart from other political uh, factors made, uh, that might have inhibited Armenian-Turkish rapprochement, it's not worthy that this initiative of Armenian president of normalizing relations with Turkey sparked mass protests in Armenian communities, particularly in the United States of America, France, uh, Russia, Lebanon, influential Armenian communities. And in the United States, uh, even uh, the Armenian community regarded this initiative as betrayal and desecration of Armenian genocide. So under sheer pressure, he submitted the protocols to Armenian Constitutional Court to evaluate their compliance with Armenian constitution. And this step, in fact, uh, caused frictions with Turkey and significantly uh, obstructed Armenian-Turkish rapprochement. So, uh, what can be concluded here? That both the first and third presidents uh, confronted huge public opposition to settling troubled relations with Turkey. And it turns out that Armenian uh, society still tends to uphold the enemy image of Turkey and is very sensitive to any step towards uh, normalization of bilateral relations. And my reading is that having inside the decline of uh, first president, Saksan avoided acting against conventional wisdom and significantly hardened position on Turkey and Azerbaijan. This can be manifested in growing number of appeals to the enemy images of Azerbaijan and Turkey. I have counted all his appeals, coded and uh, counted. And uh, what's even uh, more surprising, that he resorted Armenian president, initially regarding uh, 
neighbors as uh, like uh, significant and indispensable partners potentially. Later, we resorted to civilizational hovering of uh, neighbors by transferring Ottoman Empire's reputation to uh, Turkey and contending that Azerbaijan and Turkey are identical entities, uh, enemies uh, that uh, st he actually embraced static image, contending that uh, those two entities have not changed and will never change. They are remediably aggressive, inherently dangerous, non-European, and uh, you can see dictatorial, coercive, belligerent. Uh, so, another foreign policy uh, setback that Armenia endured in uh, 2013, as I mentioned, was the U-turn, the shift uh, from the association agreement with the European Union to the Russia-led Eurasian Economic Union. Indeed, uh, the simplest explanation would be that uh, Armenia was bullied into joining this union. And the core argument in Armenian foreign policy discourse was that the association agreement with the European Union would have little effect on Armenia's security in the face of hostile policies of Azerbaijan and Turkey towards Armenia. And to justify your turn, uh, President Saksel regarded the EU's policy and Eastern partnership as inappropriate in terms of uh, building Armenia's uh, resilience against foes. Uh, and meanwhile, the strategic partnership with Russia has been broadly regarded as a viable counterweight to Turkish-Azerbaijani alliance. And as he also mentioned, uh, the pivot of Armenia's uh, security. It follows that uh, the enemy images of Azerbaijan and Turkey have been widely used to justify uh, foreign policy decisions and particularly this decision. Essentially, Armenian president, as you can see, has largely framed Armenia's neighborhood as irremediably hostile, say, dog eat dog system, in which security alliance with Russia is indispensable to Armenia's survival. And I also uh, tried to uh, scrutinize the relationship between appeals to enemy images and appeals to the uh, security alliance with Russia. And it turned out that uh, there is basically positive relationship since, as you can see here, like uh, every appeal to the enemy images and dangerous threats facing Armenia is followed by basically followed by emphasis on security alliance with Russia, which is deemed pivotal. And I tried to scrutinize this relationship. You can see that uh, the exception is uh, 2016, when these two lines, uh, the red line is the appeals to security alliance with Russia, blue one to enemy images, went in a positive direction in 2016, uh, since uh, during the heavy fighting eruption between Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, actually, there was Russian inactivity, which generated some resentment. Overall, my reading is that uh, the second president, uh, Robert Kocayan, has put uh, Armenia in a situation where it's extremely vulnerable to Russian coercion, with little to no room for maneuver. Even though um, current president initially adopted status quo challenging agenda, he wasn't consistent enough to push it forward. Rather, he carried on with uh, his predecessor's agenda and, broadly speaking, focused chiefly on sustaining his power. And in conclusion, I would like to refer to an in interview with the first Armenian foreign minister, Rafi Ovanisan, who framed Armenia's president's foreign policy as a set of deplorable strides aimed at perpetuating his power in the name of serving national interests. And that also pretty much uh, my approach to this foreign policy. Thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer your questions.